بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین الرحمن الرحیم مالک یوم الدین السلام علیکم today we are going to look at a topic and it is called prey station now prey station might be a provocative term and many people might think what is he doing bringing up a subject like this but prey station is very very important and it captivates many people now just like this game when it came out on PlayStation 1 and then they brought out PlayStation 2 it captivated the minds of millions of young people and not so young people I've seen it in many homes where I see the adults playing PlayStation all day long and the young people as well they also play PlayStation and I'm not here today to say anything uh, negative or bad about PlayStation that's not the topic the topic today is about Pray station. And as Muslims, we attend pray station. And if we are a good Muslim, and if we are doing what we are supposed to do, we should attend this pray station five times a day. Now, the pray station for Muslims is attending mosque or going to mosque, going with a group of people to pray together as a community. Now, this can be done in the quiet of your home, which is permissible. Or it can be done with a group of friends, or it can be done in any place that you want. You can do it on the field, you can do it on the side of the road, uh, you can do it at a soccer match or a cricket match, you can do it anywhere. But the idea is to pray five times a day. And so when we use the word pray station five, I want you to get into your mind how exciting it should actually be. You know, when I came to, to visit India, I had to be at the airport two hours early. This was required for, for me to to get onto the plane. So I had to sit at the, at the aircraft lounge for the lounge at the airport for two hours before I could get onto the flight. Now why is that? Because they wanted to make sure that I had all my luggage packed, that everything was on board the plane, that all my passports were stamped, that all my documentation was right, and then only once that was all done and all the visas were checked and everything was okay, they gave me the ticket, and then about half an hour before the plane was about to take off, they allowed me to climb onto the plane and I had to go upstairs and I had to go through all these rituals before I could get onto the plane to leave the country I came from to come to India for a conference. Now, when it comes to going to mosque or praying five times a day, it's amazing how many people start walking into the mosque when the Imam is ready starting to read Surah al fatiha And we're not getting to mosque on time because we don't have that, that zeal, that excitement that we should have. And so my challenge to you over the next few weeks or the next few episodes that we have is to get you excited about your faith, to get excited about Islam. And so as young children or as some adults do enjoy PlayStation, I want you to get excited about PlayStation. So PlayStation 5 is something that you need to apply to your lives. And whatever I say to you, I apply to myself as well. Because there are many times that I also feel that maybe I'll just do it at home, Maybe no one will notice me if then I'm not there at mosque. I can just do it here and I can do a quick, quick one and rush off and go and do something I want to do. But it mustn't be like that. It must be done because you want to do it. And so prayer is such an important part of our lives. It is important to almost every faith and every community that you come across. Our Christian brothers, our Jewish brothers, our Hindu brothers, people from all different faiths, they all believe that prayer is an important aspect. Even the atheist who say, claims that there is no God who claims that he believes in nothing in time of torment or in time of pain or in time of anguish or excitement, he says a prayer. Sometimes he might just be saying his, that prayer to himself. But there is a time where everybody calls out to something or someone. And for us as Muslims, we don't believe that we call out to something or someone. We believe we call out to Allah. He's beyond description. He is beyond us put into a box. You see, for us as Muslims, we don't have pictures, idols, or diagrams, or, or figurines, or we draw a flame, or, or, or spirals to try and depict God, because God is greater than that. And so when we come to pray five times a day, we realize that that is an important part of our faith, is to imagine that we are able to see God, but we do not have a picture of Allah. We don't have a, a vision in our head of what Allah looks like. But we imagine that we can be in His presence, and that he is watching us as we are speaking and as we are, we are talking. But before we go into to prayer, or before we go into doing our salah, 
what we do is there is a requirement. Just like there was when I went to the airport and I was about to board a plane, there were requirements. I had to have my passport stamped, I had to go through customs, everything had to be in place. And it's a ritual. None of us like it. Now, there are some people who don't like the rituals that we have to go through before we do our salah. But these are rituals and these are requirements that are given to us in the Holy Quran. And so we need to obey them. We need to obey the laws in the Quran. So we as Muslims, we don't get a picture of Allah or a picture of God in our head when we are praying. We don't have an image that we, we see in our mind's eye. You know, some cultures or some religions they have a man sitting on a throne and with a long white beard and long hair and a halo and white light behind him. We don't get pictures like that in our mind as Muslims. You see, God cannot be, Allah cannot be limited to a human form or limited to any object or any created thing. So we as Muslims, we do not get a picture of Allah or God in our minds when we pray. We don't see maybe a man sitting on a throne with a, a halo on and a big bright light behind him, the long beard and white shining hair. We don't get pictures like that in our head because that would mean that we are limiting God to a shape or a form. And that would be wrong because Allah, God, is beyond a human, a human description or a human confinements of this world that we live in. And so as Muslims, we have a picture in our mind of Allah seeing us, but we do not have a diagram or a picture or a picture graph or, or anything that we have that we can suddenly say, this is what Allah looks like. So in prayer, it's very important for us to connect with Allah, but without putting any shape or form to it. Now, I meet many people that say when they're making prayers or when they're praying or when they're doing salah, it doesn't feel like it's going anywhere. It seems to go as far as their breath and then it just falls flat. It doesn't seem to go anywhere. And so what I need to ask is, are we connecting properly? Are we connecting to the source? Are we allowing the source, Allah Ta'ala, to change us? Because that's what happens in prayer. When we pray, when we're doing our salah, we are not changing Allah in any way, but we are being changed by Allah. So the change takes place within us. Now, oftentimes people say you guys are extreme and you pray five times a day. And what's the point? Because you guys don't seem to change in any way. You still fight and you still argue and you still have problems in your marriage and you still have issues to deal with. Now, people say if prayer worked, these problems wouldn't be around in the world. Maybe it's the attitude that we go into Salah with. And when I read through the Quran, and especially in the third chapter of the Quran, it says in 195, and I'll read it, it says, Those who remember Allah always in prayer, standing, sitting, lying down, or on their sides, and think deeply about the creation of the heavens and the earth, saying, O oh Lord, you have not created all this without purpose. Glory to you, exalted above all the other things, and give us salvation from the torment of the fire. So what does it say? It says that we haven't got an excuse not to pray or not to do our salah. Now many people try to find excuses why they, they're not going to pray. And like I said before, we don't only pray five times a day, we pray hundreds of times a day. And many of us try to find an excuse or a reason why we shouldn't pray. So I want to have a look at five types of levels of prayer, or five different um, stages or types of people that pray. So not so much about the stages or the levels of prayer, but more about the type of people that pray. Now, many of us will have a look and be able to say, I am either number one, two, three, or four, or five. And so, as I speak about these are not the only five, I'm sure that many people will have other descriptions and have other things to say. But this is just my personal opinion. So I don't speak on behalf of all the whole Muslim community when I say this, this is just my opinion. And so when I look at people who are in prayer, there are a number of reasons that people seem to either succeed in their prayers or fail in their prayers, have success in their prayers or don't have success in their prayers. And so the first one is that when a person comes to pray or when a person comes in to do his salah, his prescribed five times a day prayer that he either goes to mosque or does with his community wherever he happens to do his salah, what he does is he goes into wudu. Now wudu is the washing, the ritualistic washing. And he does it in three and a half seconds. Have you seen those guys? They sometimes come to the mosque and they have a five second special. They barely sat down and they're finished. They have the other guy who comes in, maybe he, people say, Joe, this guy may as well take a shower. And so what we need to do is we need to keep balance and everything. Remember that Islam is the middle way. It's the balance. 
And so when we come to do a wudu, it's not worrying about what our friend on the left is doing or what our brother on the right is doing. It is concentrating on our movements that we are doing. When we wash our hands, are we doing it just to wash our hands and not thinking about what we're doing? Are we thinking about what our hands have done since the last time we came and spoke to Allah? Are we thinking about washing away the things that we have done wrong and asking forgiveness for these things? When we wash our faces, are we remembering the senses? Are we remembering our mouth, what we said, what we smelt, what we saw, what we heard? Are we remembering to confess those things that we have done wrong? You see, we mustn't just go there and just be ritualistic and not knowing what we are doing when we are doing wudu. And so preparing for prayer is, is a very, very important part of the whole, the whole ritual. And so these rituals that we do, some people criticize our rituals. And some people say, you guys just do it without thinking. And yes, they're probably right. If we are doing it without thinking, what's the point? We must know why we are doing things. We must do our wudu, we must do our prayers with having knowledge and awareness of why we are doing these things. And so we're going to take a short break. And after we come back from the break, we're going to continue and look what happens as the next step. After you've done wudu, what do we do next? We'll see you right now. Welcome back. In the last segment, we spoke about how we have different types of people, five different types of people, and their different levels of commitment to Salah. And so I said when we go through Salah, we need to make sure that we do our wudu properly and we do it with the right motives and the right reasons. It's no use going into Salah without having the right intentions. So the first group of people, when they come to doing their, their wudu, when it comes to doing the Salah, they do it rushed. They haven't got time to think about what they're doing and it's just unconscious rituals that they do and they have no real understanding of why they're doing it. You know, some people when they come into the masjid, it looks like they, they're pecking for seeds on the ground because they do their, their salah so quickly. And everything is a rush quickly to get out as fast as possible. And they can say, well, at least I did what was required of me. I pray five times a day, but I do it as quickly as possible without any thought, without any thinking behind it. I'm busy worrying about other things at the same time. The second group of people that we often find in life when they do their salah or when it comes to spending time talking to their creator or spending time with Allah is the type of person who comes in or maybe um, they arrive at the, the mosque maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes early. They're not those people that come in the middle of the, the prayer already. They get there early. They do their wudu properly. They do everything that they're supposed to do but their mind is wandering. They are busy thinking during the salah. They're busy thinking about their business or maybe they're thinking about the shop or they're thinking about the problem that they had with their wife and so they're not really concentrating properly on what they're supposed to be doing but they read all the requirements they did their wudu properly they drink all their, their salah properly they're concentrating on all the movements and stopping at all the right spots and all the right places but their mind is wandering the third type of person that we find in when it comes to salah is a person who wants to do two things at the same time and this person, what I mean by they want to do two things at the same time, is that when they go into, into Salah, they do the Wudu 100%. They do their Salah 100%. They concentrate on everything they say, and their commitment is deep, and everything they do seems to be right. But what happens is they want to do Jihad and Salah at the same time. They are fighting against the temptations of life. The Shaitans will come and they will put ideas into their head and say, well, you're not worthy to pray. You're not at the point in your life where you should be praying like this. Look at all the wrong that you do in your life. And so what happens, they seem to be in a jihad in the middle of the salah. And so instead of, of concentrating and putting all those things out of their mind and saying, saying, I reject all the attacks of shaitan and concentrate on the salah, they seem to be in jihad. But there's nothing wrong with it. They are still performing their salah correctly. The fourth group that we have, the people, when they perform their salah, what they do is they are making sure that they perform their salah properly. Their hand position is done properly. Their movements are done properly. They pause between every single movement and they concentrate devoutly on what they are doing. But their level of commitment, they just battle to find that connection. They battle to see in their minds, if there is such a thing as a mind's eye, they battle to see Allah watching them. And they battle to see themselves seeing Allah. So there seems to be this gap. But in all other forms, and they have their commitment to their heart is right, everything is right. Their intentions are right. Their 
movements, like I said, or everything is perfect. But then you get the final group. And this group, they do their wudu, they do their salah, they do their connection, everything is spot on. They would get 10 out of 10. And when it comes to understanding Allah, they have this love, they have this compassion, they have this care. They really see Allah seeing them. And they really see themselves seeing Allah. And they really connect and have this deep connection. And so our aim is, as Muslims should be to get to that same level. We want to be on level five. So let's look at these, these five types. Let's go through them again. The first one is we see that the first type, these people are just doing it. Maybe they're doing it because mother and father told them they have to do the salah. Maybe they're doing it because their friends are doing it. Maybe they don't know why they're doing it. Maybe it's just blindness out of they're doing it and they have no reason for really doing it. They just go do it. And so these people that are doing it are punishable because they're not doing it out of sincerity. They're not doing it because they want to do it. They're just doing it out of some unknown reason. They don't even know themselves. So that's not a good group to be in. We don't want to be like the first group. The second group is accountable because this group that goes into Salah, they know why they're supposed to be doing it. They know why they're supposed to be doing the prayers. It's not like they're just doing it uh, as brain dead people. They know exactly why they're doing it. So they are accountable because they are almost there, but they're not as bad as the first group. The third group are striving to do jihad at the same time as they're doing their salah. And so what happens, they are basically on the right track. But the problem is they're spending so much time concentrating on the attacks that are happening in their lives and not concentrating on perfecting their salah properly. But they're on the right track. And so this is not sin. They're actually not on sin. They're sitting on the, on the pass mark level. And of course, as we as Muslims, we aim for perfection. We are called to success. When the call to prayer comes out, we are called to success. So we know that as Muslims, we may be successful. So we don't aim for the 33 and a third. We don't aim for the 40% pass mark or the 50% pass mark. We want 80 to 100%. In fact, we almost aim for 100% in everything that we do. The fourth group is a group that, remember, they are rewarded for what they do because they are sincere, they have their right connection, but they, all they're missing is that, that connection of love, that actually seeing that Allah is watching me and that I have that connection, that closeness, that that love that we should have. And often we're afraid as Muslims of that word L-O-V-E because we somehow think that it is connected with the way Christians, you know, it's always about emotions and feelings. But as Muslims, we sometimes miss out with that word love. You know, as Muslims, we read the Quran and the Quran tells us with factual information how to live the Muslim life. Once we have that factual information, we take an emotional response to follow Islam. So there must be that love connection as well after the facts are there. See, many faiths and many beliefs in the world, they base their religion or their faith on the emotional, emotional side. You must have this warm, fuzzy feeling inside of you, and that means you're close to God. And then what happens by, if they're coming to, maybe they go to church on a Sunday or they come to meetings on a Sunday, but Wednesday they feel like they're disconnected from God again, they're disconnected from Allah. And that's because it was built purely on emotion. So there needs to be that foundation first, the foundation on solid evidence, solid truth. And that's what we find in the Holy Quran. Then the reaction from that is love and compassion and feeling. And so then the last and final group that we have, the fifth group, is the group that has that connection. And that's what we want to be. We want to be that fifth and final group. We want to be that group that really connects and really loves Allah. Now, when we pray or when we do our salah, we need to take time to, to do our salah. Don't rush. There's no reason to, to sprint through it. We're not running in a marathon. Like I said, when, when we watch our brothers on our left and our right doing wudu, we mustn't worry about them. Well, if they want to take a half an hour, that's their problem. But we must make sure that we are doing our wudu to the best of our ability, what is pleasing to Allah. And when it comes to do our salah, it's exactly the same. And don't be in a rush to leave the mosque. This is a special time. I remember one brother once explained it to me this way. He said, we are given 24 hours a day and all Allah expects is 24 minutes back. Now, if we think that it's only giving such a small amount of time back when we're doing our salah, from all the 24 hours that we are given in the day, and we should be grateful for that. And so we mustn't rush these things. 24 minutes is not much out of our life, out of our busy day. So it's really nothing. Remember this body that you were given, there's no rental on it. Allah doesn't send you a bull at the end of the month and say, listen, you owe rates on this property that I gave you. 
You don't have to pay for it. You got given it for free. The lungs that you're given, these machines that allow you to breathe and experience life and enjoy everything that you have and bring oxygen to your brain so that you can think, were given to you for free. There's no one coming to collect at the end of the month. You don't get an electricity bill or a power bill at the end of the month for your brain. It is given to you for free. So when you give those 24 minutes back, you must be happy and you must do it with kindness and love and compassion and understanding. So we must do to Allah what we want Allah to do to us. And we don't just do it because you're receiving rewards for, for doing what is right. We do it because it's right. Sometimes we do things only because we're going to get a reward. You know, we have children and we say, if you wash the car, we'll give you $10 or $5 or whatever it is in the country you come from. Instead of telling them to do it because they love you, because they care about you and because you love them back. So it's important that we know why we are doing things. Second point that I would like to bring up, we start coming to an end with this, is that we need to pray often. Remember, it's not just five times a day. You pray hundreds of times a day. So take that opportunity, whether you're just about to fall asleep, lie on your side and thank Allah for this day. Thank Him for giving you rest and help Him to clear your mind so when you sleep at night, you have a clear mind. And pray with your friends. When you get a group of people together, it's very important to pray together. Spend time together praying. Whenever you have an opportunity, build that, that relationship with your fellow men around you. And one of the, the talks that we'll be doing in the future is about the importance of choosing friends correctly. Choose friends that pray because they will help you to become a stronger Muslim. And then the, the last thing I'd, I'd like to talk about is, or last point that I'd like to mention is that Prayer changes you. Prayer makes you a better person, and prayer must be put into action. Prayer is not just something way off. It must be moved into action. You must act upon what you've asked. If you say, I'm sorry, Allah, for what I have done wrong. I'm sorry that I sold somebody a plate of, of 10 apples when I was supposed to be 12 apples on the plate that I sold on the side of the road. You need to now go make right that. So you need to put into action what you're praying about. So if you've done something wrong, you need to go make right what you've done wrong with that person as long as it makes the situation better and not worse. So whatever you do in the days to come, whatever you do in the weeks to come, remember to take your time with your salah. Remember this is an awesome, awesome responsibility and it's an awesome privilege that you have been given. An res awesome responsibility because you're now standing before the creator of everything. An awesome opportunity because he's actually listening and he cares and he wants to listen and wants to hear what you have to say. So, inshallah, in the days to come, as you move forward in your life, and as I move forward in my life, let's make the most of that opportunity when we pray five times a day to use it to the best of our ability. And remember, Allah loves you, and you owe it to Allah to love Him back. Jazakallah for listening, and inshallah, we will meet again soon.